This week on The Handle. In the second of a three-part series on the city's in-depth neighborhood plans, learn about the past and future of Amarillo's Barrio and get an exclusive tour of Llano Cemetery. Plus, get bitten by the retro gaming bug. All of this right now on Panhandle PBS as we tell the stories of the Texas Panhandle. Barrio, you know, the word means the neighborhood, mm -hmm. specifically the Mexican-American neighborhood. But to me, it means the residents, the churches, the schools, uh, the parks, the good times, the fiestas, the great restaurants, you know, real authentic Mexican food. If you want to go by textbook, well, it's a neighborhood. But in that neighborhood, in these from the railroad tracks to Ross Street, and from 3rd and Arthur to 27th and Arthur, Barrio is my family, my people. You know, it's a time for us to all realize, hey, this is our community. We're responsible, we need to take care of it. We need to partner with the city and whoever's willing to invest in the neighborhood, not only for today, but for the future. They started in, early 2017 um, for that planning process and completed it in April 2018. Uh, so it's the second plan that the city and the county worked on together for the neighborhood planning effort. And how important is it to have the county involved? Uh, very important. Uh, they were actually one of the initial partners that helped encourage the, the collaboration between the city and the, the county to do this uh, neighborhood planning effort. So their participation um, is important just from a stakeholder involvement, but also from a funding standpoint, they, they contribute uh, additional funds each year to go toward these planning efforts. So it was a good 13 months of bringing residents and community people um, on that committee together to decide what's gonna go in the plan. There are 19 goals and 36 strategies in this plan, and so now we're called the Barrio Neighborhood Planning Committee, or the BMPC, and we are implementing those goals and strategies. First steps are usually just um, big picture discussion about the strengths and uh, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, a SWOT analysis uh, is what they call it. Really understanding where they see the neighborhood today, um, what the strengths are, what they'd like to see improved, and then you kind of grow from there as far as getting their thoughts of big ideas. Um, we don't want to restrict them to, well, we don't have funding or we can't really prioritize this. We want whatever they can think of, dream big as far as what they want this neighborhood to look like. So that's really what they kind of focus on, those public meetings and with the advisory committee, really vetting those uh, ideas, uh, figuring out who needs to be involved in it because it's not just a, a city plan. The city's not going to be able to do everything in this plan, so it's a lot of citizen participation and involvement and what can, what can we all do to work on these, these goals together. You know, you can have a dream about something, but when it's in writing, then it's time to implement. And so it's, it's been easier for us to be able to say, okay, this is goal number seven, and this is the, these are the strategies, and here's what we're gonna do next. And so what we do is we, I, I call it uh, 10 projects in motion. We keep 10 projects on the forefront to say, okay, this is what we're working on next. So one of those projects was the 10th Avenue mural with our historical sites uh, for the Barrio side and then for Center City, and that was completed in, in July. On the south side, basically it depicts the barrio, our churches, uh, the park, the community centers. And on the north side, it is, uh, it pertains more to downtown Amarillo. You know, if you're coming from downtown Amarillo east, we're welcoming you into the barrio neighborhood committee. If you're leaving the neighborhood, heading towards downtown, we want you to be welcome to downtown. I think with the mural project, I think we've awakened a lot of people and we're gonna bring the pride back. It was a good uh, visible, um, visible thing to accomplish first. So uh, I think they had well over 100 people attend the ribbon cutting uh, for that. So it was something everybody's proud of and wanna, and I think it'll spur more murals and more art projects throughout the neighborhood. That really checked off a few different boxes as far as getting public art to the neighborhood, working on a gateway, um, bringing a, 
addressing the historic nature of it because it's got historic buildings within the murals. So that one was really a low hanging item that they wanted to try and get out there just so people could see stuff occurring in the neighborhood. Because if you, if you work on water lines or maybe do a sidewalk project, it doesn't have quite the, the impact as something like an art project. They've also wanted just people to learn more about the, the bar neighborhood, so they did a historic book, um, which is also a fundraiser to help pay for some of the neighborhood planning efforts. Uh, and most recently, they did a historic uh, map, uh, location map for the neighborhood, and actually did a contest where if you go visit those locations, you could uh, enter to, to win uh, prizes. The Breakfast in the Barrio group, when they met in July of 2017, they made a list of needs for the barrio. One of them was to record the history. And also, my husband and I were serving on the Barrio Neighborhood uh, Committee, and in that, it was we needed to record the history. So when I was approached to head up a task force for this, um, we decided to call it the Amarillo Barrio Historical District. And I'd never written a book. Um, our task force members hadn't written a book. Uh, we had to think, who do we ask? Who are the early residents? Are they still living? Uh, where are their relatives if they're not living? Which businesses and organizations and churches were, were truly involved in this neighborhood? Um, where are all the photos? Well, in 1887, Amarillo was born. And then in 1889, there were two subdivisions. The Mir unit, which is actually where Sanburn Elementary is, um, that came about in 1889. Um, in this book, out of the 15 early residents, nine of them, their families worked for the railroad. And they talk about that. For example, our oldest uh, person that we put in the book, Mateo Lopez, actually came here in 1921. And um, his cousins came also. And they came, the Santa Fe brought them over legally to work on the railroad, and then he brought his family to be here, and, they, and he, his family remained here. His grandson, David Rosas, serves on our BMPC board today. I grew up in the neighborhood. I grew up across the street from where we're sitting right now, and we're at the Alamo Community Center. My grandfather, Don Mateo Lopez, along with other men of the community, pulled together and built this building for the neighborhood to have a place to hold meetings, dances, community events. Uh, my father, my uncles, they took care of the building through the years and it's, it has been given to the community and now it is a part of the Wesley Community Center, which was another uh, big community center in this, in this area. And the Wesley Community Center is one of our historical sites. The original Wesley was built in 1951. It was a house that had bedrooms in it, and they just worked on it and, and changed it up to be the center. This facility has been here since 1981. This center is just truly the heart of this neighborhood because it serves children from babies to elderly people. It has a senior citizens program, a, a daycare. Kids come here every day after school for their after school program various activities. Uh, they're doing a great um, job in just serving so many families here. Our oldest church is Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. It will be 101 years old in October of this year. Um, it actually was the Sacred Heart Cathedral on Ninth and Taylor, and then it was moved into the Barrio neighborhood, and then it was moved to its final destination on 11th and Houston Street. And they moved there in order to open in 1928 the school the Catholic school. So a lot of our residents went to uh, either Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, that would have been as early as 1928, or they went to San Bern Elementary in 1922, or they went to Glenwood in 1921. Another school they went to, which is uh, currently Region 16 Head Start, is the Dwight Morrow Elementary School. And at that, that was built in 1930, and most Mexican students went there to that school. So Our Lady was first, and then it was 10th Avenue um, Methodist Church on 10th and Roberts, which is today Power Church. And that was actually built in 1928. And, but the windows in it, the stained glass windows, are from the late 1800s, around 1880, and it came from Polk Street Methodist Church. They donated the glass windows to that. We've always worked together. You know, most of the people here while we may not be blood related, we share aunts and uncles. My friends, 
and I, we may not be related, but we share an aunt, an uncle, a cousin. So it's a big family oriented community. There's generations, you know, some of these houses and properties have been in the same families for 80 years. Our oldest living resident is Mary Magdalena Martinez, and you may not know her name, but you may know La Frontera, because it's her family that actually opened up the Cuellar Grocery Store, which then became the Cuellar Grocery and Corn Tortilla Factory, which is today La Frontera Mexican Restaurant. And so it's been really neat to be able to see that. And in her case, eight generations of her family have lived here. This neighborhood was started more than 100 years ago, and I think it's just been, a after everything was made and things were going, I don't think anybody's paid real attention to the, the condition of housing, lighting, streets, sidewalks. Uh, but it is something that every neighborhood needs. It's from our history that we can really plan our future and look at what's been successful, what's been helpful, and then where do we go from here? I think this, the, the community involvement's been great as far as this plan uh, in particular. The committee really grabbed it by the reins and, and ran forward on it, not waiting for the city, not waiting for anybody. They just know we wanted to work on this historic book, we want to work on these fundraisers. Um, it's important to have those neighborhood community members pushing these plans um, and keeping keeping everybody focused on them. So I think that's been, been really good about this plan. What did they tell you they don't like that they want to change? Um, similar, similar to what we hear in a lot of our older, um, older neighborhoods, it's the condition of housing or a variety of housing. Um, in, in this neighborhood in particular, healthcare was one that they'd like to see more of um, as far as options for their residents. Uh, so something that came out of that was they organized uh, free health clinics uh, for healthcare and dental uh, that they've held a few now and actually have a couple more uh, for this year that they're basically showing that there is a demand there for it and hopefully that might encourage someone to open up a, a brick and mortar location in the future. And we found that as a need in our plan. How many of our families were actually getting medical services we're actually going to see their doctor because in the barrio it's a 950 acres of land however there's only one medical facility in the entire barrio neighborhood um, we are looking at a lighting project on 10th avenue which will run from garfield to ross it'll be in three phases so it'll run from uh, garfield to cleveland cleveland to roberts and then roberts to ross and what that will involve are new ada sidewalks It'll be trees, decorative lighting, and trees. We've done some preliminary uh, drafts of what a streetscape project might look like um, along 10th, similar to downtown where you have the trees and the pedestrian lights and the, and the sidewalks. So that's been one project they wanted us to investigate further um, here in the future. And we've also looked at additional lighting for the underpass to help with the pedestrians and just lighting up that mural at night for, for people to see. People will ask then, well, how are you going to fund that? Well, it'll be city and us as well, the BMPC. So our first fundraiser we did was at the historical sites, and our second one will be the art show. And so we will all proceeds from those will go to uh, fund this lighting project. And that art show in um, January, from January 16th through 18th, is really going to show people in any kind of art medium. Uh, the historical sites and the historical people, the early residents. So there's stories with each one. From 10th, then we'll move to 3rd, then we'll move to Arthur, then we'll move to 27th, and then the west side of Ross. Arthur Street, which is a very busy street and the main thoroughfare here in Amarillo, I'd like to see it dressed up, cleaned up. Arthur Street is important to us during them times when we hold our parades as Polk Street is to the rest of the city and I'd like to see us see it recognized as so. Infrastructure is a, is a major one that needs to be addressed. Uh, lack of sidewalks, um, maybe the water lines aren't large enough. If someone was to come in here and want to do a large multifamily development or redevelopment, um, so that's something we need to address. Um, ADA accessibility related to those sidewalks, so um, that just comes with these older neighborhoods that back then we didn't have a requirement that each development had to come in and put sidewalks in. Once, once the ball gets rolling, it never needs to stop.
even though it's a cemetery to me, it's a living history of, of the people that came here before us and uh, we're just blessed to be standing on their shoulders. Llano Cemetery is a repository of memories and the history of Amarillo and the Texas Panhandle. So it's, it's interesting to me to walk through the halls of this mausoleum or walk the grounds of the cemetery and recognize those names and feel a connection to the past. Why are cemeteries so fascinating? They are the last vestiges of people that we hold dear. Their stories are untold because you don't know what the dash is between the two dates. People are creative in the way that they express their grief and the way they honor the lives of their loved ones, whether it's through extreme opulence or through rocks that they express the passion of a man. Um, the things that they put on the epitaphs, you never know you know, what they're going to say. There's humor and there's sorrow. And in some ways, it's, there's just so much history as you walk amongst them. And if you're a historian and you know those people, it's like you're walking with kinfolk. So you just kind of walk amongst them like, yeah, I know that guy. You know, I know who that is. And oh yeah, that's so-and-so over there. And so to me, they just have always held a fascination since I was a little kid. I love, love, love old cemeteries. The cemetery was established in 1888. There's a couple of stories as to how it began. The oldest, more reliable story is that a child passed away belonging to a Hathaway family, and that child was buried there and later was removed to Dallas. The more legendary story that you kind of hear typically if you go to the tours is that a, either a child or a young woman by the name of Lillian Morrow passed away as her family was traveling through on wagon to go from, um, from Missouri, I believe, into the western parts of the United States. Um, they asked the Clisby family to bury her there, and she was the first permanent burial there. And there is a marker for her there. Why are some stories more reliable than others? Part of them become legend over time. And in the case of the Lillian Morrow story, um, it, I think that marker was probably placed later in some of the newspaper stories. When you go back into 1938 and 1921, when they're talking about the history of it, you get a little closer to the sources. And, and that's where there's some discrepancies in that story. Her current marker has it as Mrs. Lillian Morrow, but earlier um, stories will say that it was a child that came through. The most credible source for me has been Della Keys, and she did a, a, a research based from the Potter County story, and hers, she tells the story of the Hathaway child, and then later mentions that a child belonging to a family traveling through was buried there. She doesn't give names or credit, you know, anything to it beyond that. Initially, the Clisby family just allowed more people to be buried there. And eventually, in 1889, um, Potter County purchased it from the Clisby family. And they, um, then they took ownership of it. And they were using it as a pauper cemetery. And then others began to build up in the area. And the center part of the cemetery, kind of to the east of the mausoleum, is where the old part of the cemetery is. And we have a date, there's a grave or two there that actually dates before Lillian Morrow, but we believe they may have been moved to that location in some possibility. There may have been another burial spot in Amarillo, but the documents haven't led us to figure out where that was at. Um, Mr. Clisby and Judge Browning come together and they decide to join and create the, the, Yon, the Lionel Cemetery Association. And out of that is born what we know of as the cemetery to this day. Judge Browning in 1921 was kind of the leader of, of the association. Um, on a Tuesday, he went to drop the papers into the mail for the state and they found him dead the next morning. The day that the, the funeral was held for him was the day that they approved the incorporation for the, for the cemetery. And so to me, he kind of gives us all in that story. You walk in the door and you have to know C.T. Herring. He's the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. And he is just perfectly pompously buried in the, in the very center of the nave. And you walk into the, to the chapel area, right there is his grave. And he had put a lot of money into the cemetery. Um, when they built the mausoleum in, I believe, the mid-30s, no, early 30s, everyone contributed to doing it. And he passed away in 31. And so a huge amount of money, you know, was spent by those who wanted the most predominant rooms. Melissa Oliver Dor Eckel is buried there. Ernest Thompson's parents are buried there. Um, and a number of just city greats. C.T. Herring was a cattleman. 
of, of ginormous proportion. He was started out in the Vernon area and he owned, he helped to bring the, the Fort Worth and Denver Railroad to Vernon. He was a huge part of building up the city of Vernon. He was um, a co-cattleman with um, W.T. Uh, w. Wagner and um, Burke Burnett, and then they will eventually partner with Quanta Parker and run cattle up in the, in the Comanche territory until Theodore Roosevelt comes to visit and kind of puts an end to that. Then he moves his cattle industry into the Texas Panhandle in 1909, uh, moves to Amarillo, and eventually uh, will lend the money to Ernest Thompson to build the Herring Hotel, which his name is on. Avery Turner was a railroad man. He spent 63 years with the railroad, 58 of those was with the Santa Fe. He is kind of given credit for building the railroad lines through Laguna and Los Animas and that area. But he made his residency up on about 1706 Polk Street in some of the beautiful houses along the Stock Silk Stocking Row area. I think anyone can be buried in that pioneer area, but you find a lot of the old cattlemen there. Um, some of your older families, um, Masterson is in that area, R.B. Masterson is buried in that area, and some of those original families that came to the Texas Panhandle, and many of them start out like in other parts of the area and migrate towards Amarillo as they get older or their families want better education. The statue that is the, the father and the mother and the little boy was sculpted by H.D. Bugby, who is the, um, a, the first uh, curator of Art at Panel Plains Historical Museum, and his paintings adorn the walls there. The cemetery, along about mm, 1930 or so, decided to give each racial group in the city of Amarillo a, a place to bury their dead so they could, in the words of Mr. Galecki, lie amongst their own race. And that seems incredibly, I suppose, racist to us today. So as a result of that, we have a Jewish section of the cemetery. We have an African-American section. There's a Hispanic section. Um, there's a Catholic section to the cemetery. And then we have, obviously, the larger section being you know, white. There's a railroad section. We have a section that was dedicated to the railroad labor workers. Um, the flu influenza section. As I've done research on the um, on the influenza situation in Amarillo, I have always heard that legend of there being this mass grave out there. But the story in the newspaper articles aren't adding up. And I can only find a number of about maybe, at the most, 50 to 60 people that pass away. And they're scattered all throughout the, their names are listed in the newspaper, they're scattered all throughout the cemetery. But there is a number, there's like a row there of, I don't know, maybe 20 or so graves. If you go to the Catholic cemetery, there's a row of nuns from the various convents that have been a part of Amarillo's history. And there's a row of nuns there. And then all of our bishops are buried there, including Bishop Fitzsimon, our famous, um, our larger of the diocese ministers. Uh, he's there, the beautiful, the statue of Jesus and the, uh, that's in that part of the cemetery. Makes up a part of the statuary there. In the Jewish community, um, we have a, a, a small Jewish community by about 1909, about five to 10 families. Little by little, um, the population grows in the city of Amarillo. Names like Cezanne and Fenberg uh, were jewelers that started out in Panhandle and they come here. A number of our clothing stores, Colbert's, I mean, many of these stores were Jewish families who were living in the area. The black section is sort of on the south section, it's about two or three rows in, not very well marked. J.O. Wyatt in the African American section. He is, he founded one of the first clinics in Amarillo 4 over on the north side of town and provided medical care early to impoverished people across the city of Amarillo. Matthew Bones Hooks is buried in the um, African American section of the cemetery with his wife. It's a very simple um, marker for a very incredibly amazing man. And so, who did a lot for the city of Amarillo. We have over 7,000 veterans buried here, and to walk among their graves, and even by reading some of the individual memorials and monuments and markers, you can tell what they did. You can tell if they were killed in action and when. Thomas Creek, uh, who was a Vietnam veteran, um, who was killed in action, is the youngest Medal of Honor recipient in the state of Texas and the only one in Amarillo. A lot of the information we have um, archived just in our records. Um, we also work with the Amarillo Genealogical Society, the Panhandle Plains Historical Museum. Any family that has uh, any, any sort of history that they believe um, is important to share and they're willing to share with the public, um, we would be more than glad to look at what they have. Uh, 
there are tens of thousands of individuals buried here at Lano Cemetery, and everyone has a story. It is our history. It is our heritage. Um, there is, it was a sense of place and community. It was a park once upon a time. People came there and they fished and they had picnics. They had symphony there. It was a place where people came and grieved and yet they celebrate. They still kind of do with our, with the Veterans Day programs they have there. It's the last place you saw your loved one. It's the place that you go to heal. It, it unifies a town if it's, if it's done right. And in, in many, in years past, you know, Lano Cemetery was definitely the unifying force in many cases in our town because it's where everybody, everybody knew where it was at. Everybody went there for an occasion, you know, the last occasion of the last memory. It's definitely a very, very important part of our community history. Hi, I'm Nolan Hill. I've lived all over the country, and a few months ago, I pulled up stakes and moved here. And now I'm showing you the Texas Panhandle with fresh eyes. Welcome to the View from the Hill. In the 1980s, there were over 24,000 arcades in North America, pulling in an estimated $8 billion. As a kid, I spent many an hour and many a quarter at the arcade. With the introduction of home console gaming, arcades slowly began to disappear. But nostalgia has revitalized that industry, and retro gaming is making a comeback. I do I think that retro gaming is making a comeback for sure. Uh, I feel that people my age appreciate it because it's nostalgic. I think it's new to the younger crowd, and it's nostalgic to the older crowd. And you know, I think the simplicity of it was so cool too. You know, instead of having a controller with 15 buttons on it, you know, you're playing a game that's got three or four. That I love that you can walk up to a game, not have any idea what it's about, but immediately figure out what it does. And then it can be that simple, but you can still have fun doing it. So yeah, I think, I think that's intriguing to the kids too because it doesn't have to be some uh, huge drawn out first person shooter game. It can just be this goofy little, you know, I'm gonna shoot asteroids. <laughs> and it's just so neat to be able to appreciate something that's pixelated and something that's not a perfect graphic. I think that just what brings out the classic art of them, you know what I mean? And a lot of these are originals. They're, they're the original CRT monitors, they're the original joysticks, and to people who really care about them, that's what they appreciate, is that you're literally playing a piece of history, you know? It started everything. It started the, the Nintendo consoles, the Sega Genesis, the Nintendo NES. You know, people that are about 10 years older than me, it's like, they didn't get into NES or Sega or any of that. It's like, it ended with arcade games. So I think that's what brings them in, is the fact it's like, oh my God, I haven't played a game in 20 years. Well, I just think it's that uh, being a kid again. I think just wanting to be a kid again and seeing people look into the window and just, just they light up because it's like, oh man, it's like a, it's a, a toy store for grown-ups, you know what I mean? I don't know, I, I think it's just a, a combination of everything. It's feeling like you're a kid and then knowing that there's other people around you that are feeling the same way, you know, and being able to mix with them and socialize. I think it just brings it all together. Darkness 